Welcome to Shilor Select. The whole system will be ready in a few minutes. Take your seat and enjoy. All right, we're rolling, man. Ooh, we live. Okay, got my boy Louis on here tonight. How you feeling, man? What's going on? Long time no see, brother. <laughs> I know. So, I know you're uh, Assistant Director of Admissions at University of Delaware. I am. How long you been doing that? Brother, oh, wow. Admissions, the life of admissions. I've, I've been doing admissions for now. I started back in 2012. So, nine years, I think. This is my ninth year. I'll start, be starting my 10th year next year. So, 10th year in just higher education admissions, right? Yeah, just in higher education. That, that wasn't... You know, that wasn't what I came out of college doing, but it's something that I just fell into, man. And it's it's, it's an interesting concept. You know, uh, you and I both went to Radford. Right. Shout out to the alma mater, I know. Uh, are you, baby? That, that shout out all the time. Um, but I, I was I was involved on campus and stuff, doing stuff with the foreign language department, and then uh, got to meet Foster Ridpath. Uh, a lot of people may, may not know him that listen to this. <laughs> and then got involved with him through his aspect of you know, that campus rec and whatnot. Uh, and that drew ire of someone in the alumni office, right? And so I, I had known the executive director of alumni relations. And, and she knew how much I hated the job that I got into once I left college. Yeah. And she was like, why don't you apply to this? And, and you know, you work for the state now, too. You know, sometimes when applying to a state job, it takes a lot of time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Turtle pace, man. Enough, I've been fortunate enough, my brother, that I literally applied on a Monday, got interviewed on a Tuesday, got hired that Friday for my first job in admission. And that was at Radford. Yeah, that was at Radford, man. And, and I did that. Uh, it, it was, it was, I, I've been fortunate in that aspect because the same thing happened when I left and, and went for Delaware. I got interviewed on a Thursday, phone interview, did the in-person Zoom interview on Monday, was told to drive up for that Wednesday, and then offer the job the very next day. So within a week, at a different institution that I had no connections to, I got the job. And I, I don't know what it is. I, I know I was extremely fortunate for that first one. The second one, I'm, I'm going to say, Radford prepared me to interview properly. Of course. Um, but admissions in general, man, like, it's evolving. Uh, you know, I talk to parents all the time. They're like, oh, well, when I was in college, and I always want to be like, well, when you were in college, things were a lot different. <laughs> a lot. Even between us two, like, I, I applied to college in 2004, 2005. Mm-hmm. And to now, it's completely evolved. Um, and for any of your listeners that have kids or are going to have kids in the future and, and their kids are thinking about college, my piece of advice is, just go with the involvement of it. Don't try to say that it's the same. Um, Cause I hate to say it changes cause it doesn't. There's still part of the academics that you have to approach is just evolved to be a finer instrument. I, guess. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. So you're saying like, you know, compared to let's say the sixties and seventies college was not anything like it is now, you know, as far as prices and, you know, gyms and dorms and I guess the majors too, and just how big they've gotten. So you just saying evolve with, cause usually with, uh, usually with, from what I understand, most parents are concerned where those children are going to eat, where they sleep and where they're going to play. And then it seems like the academics kind of are on a back burner and my, this is what, from what I've viewed and seen, from what I see on the front lines, man, everybody's worried about what job they're going to get after college. Of course. You know, and, and I always, I laugh inside, obviously. I don't laugh outside because it's rude, right? Uh, where they're like, what kind of what kind of job can my student get with that degree? Mm-hmm. Like any job they want. Like, in fact, you and I both know jobs that are current today weren't even an option when we were freshman in college. I agree. Right, and it's the involvement of what we need. We're a consumer population, and so what are we consuming right now? It's i tech, social media. It's it's that aspect of the world that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on. Right. Uh-huh. Uh, look at uh, my good friend who who works at Radford now. He's the assistant director of social media for admission. So he runs all the social media accounts, 
which is a job within itself. You know, ask any of these influencers, right? They're always working because they're always going to, they need to provide new material for their- Getting that content. Right? So I I laugh internally when parents like, well, I want my, I want to make sure that my student does well. Well, they're going to do well if they invest the same amount of time that they do into the actual college, whatever college they go to, and turn out it's an investment, right? Whatever you put in, you're going to get back out. Uh, you know, I always joke about it. I came from Northern Virginia, mm-hmm. down to Radford University. Very different, even within the own same state. Very, very different. Yeah. But I, I invested as much as I was going to get out of it, right? And, and it's, it's an equal distribution. It's an equal payoff. And when you look at it that way, as opposed to you're just going to go there for a job, you're missing the entire aspect of going to college, mm-hmm. right? We're, we're so focused on what's the next step without having, without really realizing. And this is a quote from a great book: uh, "Where I go, where you go is not who you'll be," by Frank Bruni, right? right? And it's like, I like that. I like that. Yeah, college college is not meant to produce employees. It's meant to help you learn for now and the next level of learning. It's supposed to help you uh, figure out who you are, your ethics, your morals, your values, and where you stand. Because our world tomorrow is going to be very different, right? So, of course, of course, you know. And, and that's a paraphrase. I didn't, you know, I don't have the book in front of me, but I've used that time and time again. And parents are always like, "Well, yeah, but how much money?" I'm like. Oh, uh, you, you know, I've heard some of your other podcasts, bro. And everyone's talking about like markets and, and the economy and stuff like that. The economy is always going to work itself out somehow, some way. Uh-huh. Right. It, it's, it, I, I just, I worry that we're so worried. I, I, I'm worried that parents are so focused on one thing as opposed to more than one thing, you know? Um, and, and that's my tidbit on it. Admissions. When you're looking at it overall, just remember that where you go is not who you'll be. There are plenty of success stories coming from a small school like Radford. Of course, or even yeah. A smaller school like Randolph College. Mm-hmm. And then you have a bunch of success stories from parents are like, well, what about Harvard? They've got so many success stories. Well, yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> They're the oldest college in the, in, in the whole United States, right? <laughs> of course, they have more opportunity to have more success stories, right? Right. And, and people are trying to compare it, you, you know, one college to another, and you can't. Uh, my newest, my newest analogy that I came up with this one on my own. It is. Now I'm, I'm on this podcast, so I can kind of patent it now, right? Yeah, dude, throw it out here, man. Get your comparing message out. Colleges, comparing colleges is like comparing apples. Okay. So you're comparing apples to apples, and they're like, "Well, yeah, of course, they're the same thing, right?" Yes and no, and the fact that I found out through research. This world that we live in has over 7,500 variants of apples. 7,500? Yeah. 7,500 variants of apples. I would I would have never thought that. No right? way. I thought maybe like 20. Yeah, I probably could name five maybe. <laughs> Green apple, Bro, red there's, apple. There's, there's apples beyond measure. We can get back into this. Uh, but here in the United States alone, there's only commercial sale of about 100 different types of apples. Okay. They're all apples. Right? They're all distinguished as apples, but they're different. Some are sweet, some are tart, some are tangy, some have that, you know, that Granny Smith apple. That yeah, a little sour. Red apple that gets a little too old, then you get that granny taste. Mm-hmm. Some come like that, right? Okay. Some have a different coloring on the inside that's more like a beet red. Uh, so there's a bunch of di- different apples, but they're all apples. And so I tell students, trying to compare colleges like comparing apples they're all on the outside the same thing an academic institution that's accredited but what you find on the inside is going to be different hey you'll never find you'll never know what's on the inside without taking a bite hey okay right so investing in what you're going to take out so your bite is your investment mm-hmm. what you take from that bite is what you're taking out of college because could I have done just as well at, at a school like Virginia Tech that's right down the road from Radford? Maybe. Would I have been as involved? Maybe. Could I have done something bigger and better at Harvard? I don't know, man. Like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, right? But I, I, I can't go back to, to 
and look at my time and experience at Radford and be like, oh, I wish I could have done this or I wish I would have gone elsewhere. Right. I could never exchange what I gained, the people I met because of Radford, right? Uh, I am who I am today more so because of the people that I met mm -hmm. as opposed to the institution that I was at, right? I got set up pro properly by different people at Radford University that took care of me. Yeah. Sure I got paid through work study and then got to go to the gym for free. So, <laughs> right? Like got to, got to meet my, 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 my CrossFit guys, got to, you know, shoot the shit with y'all on stupid stuff that we would never have like encountered if I hadn't gone around. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. So I, like, that's my new thing, man, is comparing colleges, like comparing apples. There's over 7,500 variants. Mm -hmm. I like that, man. Only pick a few, man. And I, I dropped that, I dropped that knowledge on a panel that I was on last week. And a colleague was like, I could always count on you for an analogy. I was like, <laughs> I made that one up today. Let's let go. I was like, yeah, because I, I was uh, talking to my girlfriend about uh, apple pies not, not too long ago. And I, hell did I know that to make a good apple pie, there's like four different apples. Like Fiji, Granny Smith. I didn't know that. I'm not a baker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I, I remember thinking, how many apples are there? There's 7,500, bro, in this world. That's that's crazy. I would have never thought that. Here commercially in the states, huh? It's so weird. It's so weird. Like, I, I, look it up, man. I want to say, yeah. I wonder now. Make sure you got all fruits and vegetables. If there's different variants, variants of a ball yeah. now. Yeah, man. But that's uh, wild. Now nah, it's 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 crazy, bro. Uh, and now I'm at the University of Delaware. I, I did five years at, at Radford, and then. Uh, I had started the regional program, which just means I live in the area that I recruit. And back then I was recruiting for Rapid Northern Virginia. And then I got involved in some organizations. I know when you were at Radford, uh, or I mean, you're still at Radford, but when you were in a different division at Radford, yeah. you would go to the conferences, right? And you mm -hmm. know people and, and network. Oh, yeah. And, and again, it's not the institution, it's the people. Of course. The people, you know, right? So your network is your network. Um, I got involved in a couple of different organizations and, and I was able to, my name came up for a search for Delaware. They're like, Hey, there's this guy at Radford that started a, a, or implemented the regional program there. He may want to move. And I got a phone call and they're like, we want you to apply. And I was like, all right, cool. It wasn't my intention to leave when it, I left. Yeah. Just an opportunity to show up. Yeah. I had a green light come open and why yeah, not? And it, and it was time, uh, you know, uh, I tell young admissions counselors now, that are working for their alma mater, there's going to come a time where, where you start to not resent your alma mater, but you're angry with them because you you know how great they can be, and they're not, and they're not, and, and they're not stepping up to that to that batter's batter's box, right? And, well, why is it, why do you think that is? I mean, do you think it's just because of administration, or is there something holding them back? We're, we're just we're blinded for our love for our institution. Okay, you know, love is blind, bro. <laughs> 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 dude, dude so hitting. Blind, whether it be a whether it be a significant other a place you work for whatever it's it's just you have so much love and appreciation for that for that person institution whatever it may be that sometimes you miss their faults okay and, and the same thing when it comes to a relationship it's the same thing when it comes to a, a job place you know it, it's unfortunate but that's that's what it is and, and and you, you know how much potential something has, but they're not reaching it. Mm -hmm. You start to get frustrated, but you of course, it, you love it. At one point, you're going to have to leave it before you start to hate it. That makes and sense. So I got to the point where I was getting frustrated with, with, with my institution, with my alma mater. I still love it. I see you every time I come down to visit. Oh, for <laughs> sure, man. I love it. Not by right. Yeah, because it's, it's something that it, it reminds me of who I was. Uh, you know. Jimmy Valvano, it being March in the ESPYs. Ah, uh, yeah. You got to know where you came from, know where you are, know where you want to be. And it's like, it's things like that that really helped me transition in my job. Because, bro, I, you know me, I don't, I don't give a shit, two shits. Yeah. I cried my V, I, cr I called my VP to let her know uh, when, I, when I was leaving, when I was putting my resignation. And I bawled like a baby for an hour, bro. Afterwards, because I I didn't, I didn't think I ever, was ever going to leave Radford. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, 
I always thought I was going to have that connection to Radford while working for them. Or, but now I'm just that old school alum that just comes every once in a while for, for alumni weekend or basketball games. Obviously, this past year was, was tough for everybody. But uh, yeah. You, you know, you've got a, such an emotional connection with an area. It, it's tough to leave it, but I don't regret it, man. I, I'm doing – I've been able to climb even further in, in the ladder, be more involved on, on national votes. Nice. So I became a delegate for my local chapter of uh, of the ACACs, which is just uh, wait. What what is ACACs? So the NACAC, which is the National Association for College Admissions Counseling. Okay, it was the entire nation, uh, and it's just an organization that follows specific ethics and um, suggestions because we can't call it rules anymore. Uh, you know, as an organization, the Department of Justice sued us. <laughs> we, oh. can get into that if, we can get into that if you want to. Um, but because of Potomac and Chesapeake, which is a regional organization, so it's Potomac, Chesapeake, ACAC, uh, and Potomac and Chesapeake covers Maryland, Delaware, D.C., Virginia, and West Virginia. Okay. And, and through my involvement with Potomac and Chesapeake, I, I was elected a delegate. So when there was a huge vote to be made about our board of, or like our ethics that we had and our rules, I was on the national stage at a national conference making that vote to change bylaws for a national organization. So your, your ethics for the emissions? Yeah. Okay. So and the reason why the ethics, the rules of admissions and, and the organization, we had to change them is because the Department of Justice uh, sued us for antitrust. And why is that? I mean... Because apparently our rules secluded some institutions of higher ed. Uh, huh. One of the rules, one, one of the old rules was uh, don't recruit a student who's already made a deposit from after they've deposited. Uh, so deposit another university, you can't go and say, hey. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to. It's almost rec- like recruiting athletics in when they, if they sign up a letter of intent, but can't they – Correct. So it'd be like another institution would be like, let me still recruit you. Yeah, I still can come over. So, but in the admissions world is, as soon as a student puts their deposit down, all, all other institutions are supposed to back off and be like, all right, cool, you made your decision. Right? That was one of the rules that, that was our uh, preferred practices that we called them. Right? Okay. Uh, I'm with you. Another one was uh, the recruitment of transfer students. Uh, and it's a bunch of different things, man. It's a lot of mumbo jumbo that was, it, I think Jeff Sessions, the old AG, which is <laughs> either that or he had, he had a good friend in a, I don't know, you even know if he's president of that university anymore. That was, that's in Virginia. Or I'm not going to name any names, <laughs> uh, but there, there's an institution in Virginia. Okay. Uh, that wasn't part of NACAC at that point in time because their recruitment practices were unethical. They were providing, free swag to students that to apply and stuff like that uh, yeah so you're not allowed so, to do that either no so when i'm at a college fair i can't give out anything swag related like you know all those drawstring bags that we yeah, have and free t-shirts and stuff I can't give that out pins you can give out pens as long as they have the admissions email and number okay right um or, or uh now once they're once they're admitted and they come to campus for a decision day or like before they deposit, you can give them all the swag they want. Yeah. But until they, it, it's a weird thing, man. It's, See, I didn't know any of this. I, it's almost similar to athletics. And yeah. and I didn't, never would have thought that. I mean, I understand the athletics and like we just said, signing the intent. And hey, you've already said you're coming here and you can't touch them. But with students still looking around, trying to go wherever they want to go. Yeah. I didn't know you couldn't just give them out a, Free drawing brag, like you just said, or a cup, or a college fair, uh, that's that's the wild. Valley, the New River Valley hosts a college fair every every year, um, sometime in September, and all the city, all the counties from lo- local are invited. One year it's always held at, at Deadman Center, and the other year it's held at uh, New River. Yeah, and so they alternate years, and they bring in students from as far down as like uh, Withville, um, you know. And as far north as like Blacksburg, they go to Martin down towards Martinsville and that areas too. So they have another one. Oh, one down there. 
Yeah, so they have another one. But if you ever go to that one, <clears throat> like I'll shoot you a text next time I'm down there. For okay. The Whenever that may be. And you can come in and you'll see the schools that are there. The only free stuff they're allowed to give out is stuff that has the admissions not phone number or email on. That's it. Because it's, it's a promotional piece. It's not like free swag. Gotcha. Like I could never give you a free t-shirt. Which it's 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 funny. I, I get it. It's finicky, but it's it's to prevent poaching, right? It's, okay. Because you know, the other thing was, schools would call in the past. Schools would call and be like, "Oh, they offered you five thousand dollars scholarship. We'll offer you seven if you if you deposit with us." Like, there are some schools out, man, that are some that are shady in the background. See, I would have never thought of all this, man. That's wild yeah, to yeah. me. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm a firm believer. I don't know because we're not allowed to know who brought the antitrust against NACAC. Yeah, uh, but Potomac and Chesapeake was also listed as on that on that antitrust. So I'm I'm assuming, just knowing membership and knowing who's in NACAC and stuff like that, that it was a school in Virginia. That was chummy with Jeff Sessions. <laughs> the president was chummy with Jeff Sessions, and was upset that they couldn't recruit at national college fairs, hmm. like like all the other schools. Hmm. You know? And I'm not going to name any names, but um, they're they're not one of our favorite rivals. Let's put it like that. Okay, I'm with you. I'm with you. You picking up where I'm putting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that that made sense that's right there. That made sense uh, right there. Um, and, and I mean that athletically. Right. right? Um, I got they're you. Not, they're not even in our conference anymore, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, now you know who Yeah, it is. I'm with you now. <laughs> but, I, uh, but yeah, man, like there's so much to admissions that I didn't even know about until I got into it. So is this part of – because now, now you're assistant director and at Radford you were just a missions counselor, right? I was for the first three years, and then when I got promoted to be the regional – because we're a state institution, they had to give me a title change to match my pay band. Okay. Uh, to me, titles and admissions don't care, don't don't matter. Okay. At the end of the day, we're all doing the same thing. We're recruiting, reading applications, making decisions, doing yield events. Okay, so I'm wondering if that's kind of your duties changed with the title change, just like you just said, or you were more seeing the big picture as opposed to. No, my I'll, my duties my duties change <laughs> every time I say duties it reminds me of Chandler Bing <laughs> <laughs> that episode of do the duties <laughs> duties duties um, not like my involvement in admissions changed over time because I got more involved with organizations okay next year I was making through those organizations and and having opportunities to speak to minds that have been in the game for 30, 30 plus years dude. like you know that have seen the involvement of admissions and testing and, and um, grade trends and all that other stuff, man. And, and just, there's so much more to it than just what people know. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know so much about Southwest Virginia, but I'm pretty sure number one destination for anyone in the South, in Southwest is Virginia Tech. Of course. It's the big name school. Yeah. Big ACC football where it was there for a little bit. And this year they got, got they need, they need to let go. Of yeah. That's a whole different topic, but yeah, they, 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 they going downhill. Yeah. Um, but let's be for real. No one ever wants to be the coach after the coach. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, especially it's, when you follow up a legend. I mean, yeah. like I, I, I'm terrified for whoever takes over for uh, coach K and Roy and Bill self. And, yeah. All those blue blood schools. Yeah. Dude. Like th- think about it. Uh, what's his name from uh, Jim Behan. Mm hmm. My Syracuse, guys. yeah, he, he should be on the way out soon, right? Well, he's who's pretty gonna, old. He, who's gonna take? Who's gonna take up after Jim Bay? I don't know. Who who, be yeah, who, who do you get? Who do you? How do you follow up? Like you just said, Coach K and Roy and how do you, how? I would nope. You just you have to start a whole new era. I know you know Duke isn't doing. They're gonna be lucky to make the tournament this year, I think. But as a Carolina fan, bro, I'm excited about that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, but it's just odd, you know. I mean, I think we're going off topic here. But, yeah, I mean, how do you, you know, Frank Beamer, how do you follow up somebody with that type of who put that, you know, he made Virginia Tech, obviously. He, he put them on the map. Yeah. Um, 
but it's the same. It's the same thing in in admissions. Like, do you follow up by going to the same school everyone else is going to because it has that name? You gotta do and something you different. Evolve. You evolve from that. Okay. Right, uh, and, and it goes back to where you go is not who you'll be. I, I, had, I had a friend of mine who went to Virginia Tech, working a, a good city job. You know, so it's it, like, did he do bigger and better than me? You're com- you're trying to compare two completely different paths, right? And, and uh, I always I always focus that with my students that I speak to on a daily. It's like, stop worrying about competing with the person next to you. You got to compete against you. Yeah. It, it goes back to CrossFit. Like, you're not competing against anyone in CrossFit. You're competing against yourself and your times, right? And to be better. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I've always heard comparison or competing is a, you know, what, a thief of. Comparison is a thief of joy. There, there, there it is. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. So, yeah, when you start doing that to other people and yourself. I mean. and, and think of it this way you, a Southwest Virginia guy. Oh, yeah, born and bred. Would you have. Where you are at now, would you ex- would you change going to Radford? You know, like you were saying earlier, I thought that in one time that, yeah, I should have went to Tech because I would have had a Virginia Tech name behind me then, and it would have opened up more opportunities for me. And then, you know, back then, I, that's what I thought. I thought, yeah, you know, you're – you went to Radford just because you went to Radford, and that was the only school you always want to get in. And all my friends went there, and why not go there? Yeah. But now, you know, and the more I think, you know, I got older, and I said, yeah, you should have went to Tech. You could have had more networking opportunities, joined new different clubs, organizations. You know, had a whole different experience. But, I mean, looking back at it, I'm happy where I'm at right now. And I don't know, it could have been worse for me if I went to Tech. You just never know. I mean – you know, I went. I went over there a few times, and you know, party during football games and stuff. And I and I remember wondering, man, if I would have went to school here, would I would have been a piece of shit and just drank and partied and the whole time? I mean, yeah, I did my fair share of Radford too, but I wonder if it would have been even worse at Tech, just because there's so many more people and more networking opportunities. And I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy. You know, not with everything, obviously, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it always could be better. I mean, we're human, right? We yeah, be perfect. exactly. We be perfect. It's like trauma, if not perfection, right? There you go. And regardless of it, you, you did get a four-year degree. You got a master's out of it, too. Of course. And you, you got yours paid for, right? Because you, you worked for the school? Well, no. So I didn't do it that route because I wanted to do a different I, – I should have done it that route. But I wanted to do a sports management at that time, and Radford doesn't have that. So I had to find another way. But you still got it. But yeah, I mean, I could have got a degree for a paid for master's degree if I would have done it that route. But I mean, there's so many ways to game the system when it comes to paying for college. But it, it, that's neither here nor there. But I, I just, you know, for your listeners and for any of our friends that are going to have kids in the next 15 to 20 years, you're never going to get a full ride ever. Not even those athletes get full rides. Really? Nah, man. You, you still got to pay for the, You're either paying for the application. Are you paying for a book? So you got to pay for something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying, though. Like a, a I, student athlete that gets a full ride, they're still paying for something, right? Okay. Whether it's their time or even the application. Because even student athletes at Alabama and, and Virginia Tech still have to apply. Right. Now, is their admissions process completely different at those big names? It's a lot. Of, it's completely different. Maybe, maybe so, right? And I'm not gonna. I'm not going to speak on that. Because uh, the, the couple graduate classes that I took, one of my papers was comparing athletics to admissions. Nice. And, and how how oh. how much athletics has caused college to become more expensive, while still get, garnering value for the university as well. So you think that's the reason higher education tuition has gone up, mostly for, from athletics? Education has gone up because because of well, not you and I. We don't have kids, but those parents that have want better for their kids. So it's who's got the biggest and baddest buildings, right? Right. Uh, remember when Radford was building our brand new gym, what, what other institution ended up right up 81? Oh yeah. I've been to that one. Miles, I've been to that one. Expanded their gym and made it bigger and better. Yeah. Like it's a keeping up with the Joneses thing. And let's be for real at state schools, that money's got to come from somewhere. It's coming from state funding, 
predominantly taxes, uh, alumni funding, stuff like that. And our alumni base compared to other institutions is a lot smaller. We're a smaller school where we haven't been around as long. So that's why when people are like, well, why is, you know, why is that school in Charlottesville so much better academically? Mm-hmm. Well, they've, they've had hundreds and hundreds of years to perfect their academics. Yeah. And because of that, people have made money and that money has returned back to them. It, it's, man, it's, it's a whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. Who's got the biggest and baddest buildings? I There's agree with that. Yeah. There's a school in, in North Carolina that promises a student, you know, a parking space next to their dorm. What? Four different tiers of dorm rooms, bro, where, T- the fourth tier is like they have a concierge in their in their dorm building uh, that picks up their laundry and stuff like that. But like, dude, could you that, believe that? Like, that's ridiculous. Now that's going over. So the bells oh, yeah. and whistles of it, like that's what makes it cost me. But if if we really want to solve the student debt crisis, I think three things need to happen. Okay, what are they? One, we need to stop stop calling it student debt. What do you mean? It's an investment. Oh, okay, well, it is. It is an investment. When you I agree house, with that. You call it a housing debt. Do I call no. it now? No, you call it a house. You call it an investment. Buying property. Exactly. It's an you hope so. Future, right? Yeah, you get a return on that yeah. investment. Same thing with college. You're investing in yourself, not in property or land. So we need to stop calling it student debt. We need to call. We need to start calling it a student investment or a per, or individual investment. Okay. Um, the second thing is we need to completely separate athletics from academics. Uh, it, it's it's crazy to me that the highest paid Virginia State employee is a football coach. Is that Fuente? I believe so. I, that's what I thought. I think four point three mil, something like that. Yeah, it's... And, and that that's dude, that's baby money compared to some. Well, Nick Saban in Alabama, he's the highest Alabama one. Eight eight some million. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Not all of that comes from tuition. Not all of that comes from uh, ticket revenue. It's a combination of things, right? It's uh, boosters and um, ticket sales and parking sales. And some of it comes from the actual institution, but it's a combination of things that are making that even worse. The downside to that is though, if you separate it, you're going to really separate the powerhouses from the mid-majors. Yeah. Because a school like us, like Radford, is not going to be able to pay the top head coach to come and coach for us, ever. Of course. Because we don't have the means for it, and we don't have historically a program that can provide Yeah, they can't fund for that. We're, we're the basketball team that goes plays in Kentucky and gets paid to go out there and – Exactly. It's, exactly. It gets you know gets whomped. It might get what hundred thousand dollars for coming out there. Maybe yeah, whatever and, it is. And that's Gucci, and, and that provides the. Athletics. Well, that's what keeps the program going, basically. Yeah, part of it, but the other thing is, uh, when, when I was at, at Radford, and I found this out about more institutions, there's mandatory fees within your room board and tuition. Okay. And so sometimes those mandatory fees go towards things you had no idea about. Like, uh, what do you mean? So why why does all athletic events, why are they all free for students at, at Radford? Just to get the students in there? No, because it's part of your mandatory fees. Wait, okay, so that is part, to be yeah. free. Yeah, to be free or to be reduced. Ah, well, okay. For student for student prices. So it, because... That didn't click with me. I'd have a, I don't yeah, know. man. Like back then, it was like an extra thousand bucks to our mandatory fees, um, not including like the lab fees that you would do for for science or whatever. But there's there's those fees, and I urge parents to take a look into that. Because then the thing is, you better tell your son or, or daughter to go to to those athletic events because you're paying for them, right? Right. What is it? A student ticket at Virginia Tech's thirty five. I guess I don't even know. I don't remember last time I even to a game. The general public is like fifty. Yeah, roughly. It's reduced for students, but is it really reduced if you're paying for it on the front end? Nah. And what if you're not even a sports fan? Are you yeah, well, yeah, what if I never go to a game? I don't care about football. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so why am I paying this? But that's the thing. Those are part of the mandatory fees. It's like the the rule, the the price of do business there. Yeah. You go buy a car, you got to pay a processing fee every time you pay one. That's, I, I, yeah, I know how that goes. So, and you're like, wait, but 
why am I paying for you to keep my stuff for for you? I don't care. It's just part of doing business there, man. And as much as I hate to say it, college has become such a business. It is. Yeah, man. Think think of the money that's spent in college a year. It's ridiculous, dude. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, and the thing is, prices keep going up, but scholarship money isn't going up. That, I've, that's a good point. I did. I noticed that. Yeah, and it, it, it's sad because we're gonna we're gonna get to a point where it's gonna pop. The bubble's gonna pop. Bubble's so what pop. what happens then? You think? Uh, decline in student enrollment. Uh, you're gonna see more and more colleges close down. Uh, uh, so a lot of these private colleges might not even make it. You think? Exactly, and then you look at a at a state institution. A small state institution like Radford, technically, uh, we get less funding from the state because we're not providing enough. I've noticed that. You know, so of course the the big name schools are going to keep; they're going to be just fine. Like I, I said it before the pandemic started, or when we really were paying attention, uh, that we're going to be closed for a year. The big schools will be fine. They don't; they have research money, grant money, all that stuff. Right? It's the smaller schools that I was worried about. Because those smaller schools, they rely more on tuition dollars to, to provide grant research and stuff like that, research for their faculty as part of their curriculum and stuff. So it's, uh, you know, a couple of schools in, in, the, in the New England area closed down this past year, or they'll be done this May, um, and then they're not opening anymore. Um, uh, a private institution in Delaware clo- well, is one of them, Wellesley College small school that no one really has ever heard of unless you're from that area. Yeah. But it's closing down. It's a private liberal institution that has to close down. Uh, That's tough. Enrollment died because of the pandemic. Yeah. I had, I had a colleague of mine, man, that was, has been in admission since like 1991. Right. And he was like, uh, I was talking to him. I was like, what do you think about the pandemic? What's it going to do to college? He goes, it's going to be the same thing that, that happened during uh, September 11th. What? He's like, you're old enough for September 11th. I said, yeah, I remember September 11th. Yeah. Like, you know, unlike some of the students that are applying now, they were born in 2003, bro. Don't even get me started. But <laughs> like, he, he was like, when that happened, students didn't migrate far like they, they have been because they wanted to be closer to home. Just because they, they, they were scared or? The case popped off and they needed to get home. Okay. You know, Think about the the world shutting down about a year ago next week, right? Or two weeks from now. Yeah, we're, go, we're going right at a yeah, year. We're going a year. Yeah. How many students were, were stranded where they went to school because flights were shut down? Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, we had a few at Radford that way. They, they couldn't yeah. get home, so they just stayed in the dorms. Exactly. And then as an institution, you have to maintain those dorms open. But then you're also having to pay your dining room and, and staff like that. And you're losing money. Like the pandemic has made a lot of institutions bleed, yeah, <laughs> bleed green, and that's why most of them have either reopened fully or opened fully because they knew they weren't going to be able to take that financial hit. Um, it's 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 an interesting factor what this pandemic has done, but on the other hand, it has really peeled back the onion on the inequality in education in this country. How do you mean by that? comes to high school students and the opportunities that high school students have uh, and how testing really, you know, SATs and ACTs really aren't, shouldn't be the sole focus of schools. But, uh, you know, most people don't know that SATs and ACTs, all they really help is with rankings. Just as far as your rank in the recruitment series? Dude, one of the, one of the preliminary, and this is why when, 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 I have parents that are like, oh, what about Delaware? I heard they have a great, you know, like a highly ranked chemical engineering program, which technically we do. Yeah. Rankings are making bullshit, dude. Rankings are straight bullshit. Yeah. Because one of the rank, one of the criteria for the, for the ranking is how many freshmen you have sitting in an English class their first semester. What does that have to do with the with the quality of the school? Nothing. I agree. So, like, there, there's a bunch of. U.S. Newsweek, they reported a few years ago what their criteria is and stuff like that. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, this is this is bullshit. <laughs> of course, the higher, the schools that are, have been around longer 
and have more funds can be on that list, but it's because part of it, it's paying for it. Like we can, we can pay to be on that list, right? Because we can bring in the best professors and then they'll be, they'll have enough seats in their English class or so they're bullshit. Huh. You know? That's why I always tell a student, don't worry about the college that you're, that, you know, I mean, you got to worry, but it's not to the point where you're going to stretch yourself out, but understand that rankings don't mean shit once you leave the school. So, yeah, I mean, no, I've never been asked what my SAT or score was or my GRE score or anything. No, no but beyond that, a Harvard grad, does, does having that diploma on the wall really guarantee you a job? No. no. Not at all, man. College, you go to college to find out how to speak to people, how to talk to people. Find out who you are. How to network. There you go. Right, uh, and, and and I always find it funny when my parents are like, "Well, you went to Radford. You probably drank a lot." Uh, excuse me, but I've never met a CEO that doesn't like to have a drink. Yeah, I agree. Every time I've went up to conferences, like we were talking about earlier, yeah, we they're buying up stuff for us, man. I have Buy- never met a CEO that doesn't like to have. They want to have a good you know, time. The wine or good bourbon, yeah, with a cigar if they're a smoker, like. That's where you make the opportunity to have a job. Uh-huh. But like I always joke about it, not joke about it with my students, but I always tell them, you know, a degree will help open the door. But once you're in there, it's all on you. Bro. Yeah. It's all on you. How you speak, how, how your tone, uh, how you articulate yourself as, as an individual. Well, it's like what you said earlier, how much work you put into it, what you're going to get out of it. So exactly. Exactly. if you go in there and half ass it, that's what you're going to get. Yeah, of course, is that is there that two percent of the population that, because of a last name or because of, you know, the lineage that they have, do they have opportunities before everyone else? Of course, it's called yeah, privilege. That's how it goes. It's called privilege, regardless. Uh, and, and those people may be a boss one day, or maybe a manager, or, or, or a CEO, but they're not a CEO from their own like being, right? They're they 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 got help a lot more help than most other people but they they got help right? yeah i mean you got you know they got a leg up on you know it just yeah. it happens yeah. and, and it's it's unfortunate because obviously we know the history of our country and how disproportionate it is between uh different races and stuff like that but you you've got to look at it this way if you want to make change you can't just speak about it you got to do it of course whether it be in your own life or in the world around you, whatever it may be, like you just can't, you just can't remain stagnant about it. Yeah, you got to do something. You got to put some type of effort. You got to evolve. Um, but it, it's it's an interesting factor now. Also, though, the the I guess what people are always pushing is like the big brand name schools, right? Mm-hmm. I remember being at Radford and, and trying to get Radford's name out there, and I I'd reach out to the, all these. Uh, hoity-toity independent schools that the, the families are paying a college tuition amount to go there for their for their high school student and i never got invited to speak on panels bro really yeah never like i would i'd be like oh you know i live up here if you ever need someone coming on a panel like let me know like they, nope they didn't want you dude the moment i worked for start i started at delaware emails hey we saw that you started over here would you want to come talk you know what i did man uh, I'm gonna go back to the schools that wanted me there when I was with a different school first. Okay. Then I'll trickle down and see. Then that's that's cool of you, dude. That's badass. Because you, you gotta you gotta worry about those that took care of you first. Of course. Right. You, you know. It's, yeah. Know where you came from. Exactly. And where I was at that point in time was because of where I came from. So I, you know, when people are like, "Oh, I can't believe you decided to go work with a public school on a panel instead of doing that private school," I'm like. Well, that public school has been calling me since 2012. That private school started calling me back in 2018 when I first, or 2017 when I first started working for Delaware. Yeah. And besides, so I didn't know that. Those yeah. private schools, they'll get somebody to come talk. To Their students are going to be fine. I'm more worried about the students who don't have access to a top name school to come and talk to. Them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I get that. So it's 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 an interesting dynamic. 
for me personally, where, where I'm always talking to, to new admissions counselors that, that, I, that I mentor or that, you know, I get to meet over time and they're like, well, how'd you get to where you're at? And I'm like, you, you never forget where you came from. Yeah. You can't, you can't, man, because that's who we are. Uh-huh. Does that mean that's who you have to be? Not at all. No, you can, ch- you said you can change, you can evolve. Exactly. But, um, nah, man, admissions is a funny finicky thing, bro. There's so much behind it that, that doesn't, I mean, I could, I could talk seven hours on a presentation from beginning to end and, and numbers and funnels and statistics and the probability of a student getting admitted somewhere over another student and, and all this other crap. And it's just, it's a whole, there's so much going behind, so much going on behind the curtains that is more than what the general public knows. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've opened my eyes up to a lot of things and, you know, I've worked for a university, but not in your sector, but or yeah. I still do work for the university, but yeah, I, I would have never thought there was that much difference in missions and yeah. what you can and can't do. And even on the recruitment, even on the recruitment, but even more so on the application. Chris, when you applied to, to, to Radford, do you remember how you applied? Online. Okay. Yeah. Then, I mean, I tra- I transferred into Radford. So okay. from community college. Okay. So, so I guess I just filled out the application online, paid my fee. Like, yeah. Was, do you remember how much your fee was back then? 30? Yeah. Dude, 25, some maybe? College, some college applications are now like 75, 100 bucks. No shit, bro. Yeah, bro. I th- I'm pretty sure it was th- maybe 30 or 35 remains a bell to me. Yeah. Now, like, I was, I was talking to my good buddy, uh, Jake Woodfin, who lives down at Radford, who I met because of Radford. We were at, we were at uh, McAdoo's one time that I was down there visiting. Yeah. And we were talking about his kids and how he's like, man, uh, I'm hoping my kids get to go to college for as much as I did. And I was like, bro, Radford is more expensive than when it is now than when you were there. Yeah, like, don't, don't bet on that. Yeah, it's going to keep increasing. So I, I told him, just make sure you know you invest in, in proper things like the 529 plan and stuff like that. But um, now, nah, man, admissions is – there's so much beneath that surface that, that no one really knows. And it's, it's very different per institution. So, you know, I get why students are stressed so much right now when they apply to schools and why parents are like overstressing their students too, you know? Yeah. Put it. Well, kind of yeah. echoing back here, uh, this kind of, you're talking about community college. Um, and with the pandemic, so you you know, pandemic is obviously having a hard times on the universities, as you just said. But I'm wondering also, it seemed like before the pandemic, Radford was in decline of students as far as total enrollment. Mm-hmm. So are we starting to see other students go towards the community college, trade school aspect instead of going to the traditional four year university now? Yeah. So trade school has become a big thing because we are losing skilled laborers, right? Right. Like plumbers. Welders, electricians. That's why they get to charge so much because no, no one knows what the hell they're doing with it when they the toilet other than sitting on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like that. Uh, but the, the thing is, let's be for real, we need both. We need academics and we need laborers. That, that's, for, that's what our country was built on. Of course. Right? Um, you, need, you need the academic to write the theory and then you need the laborers to put it into practice. Right. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I and it, it saddens me because obviously it's my alma mater. I feel like Radford's admissions uh, numbers declined over time because uh, we we were missing the ball. We became you know people safety school, uh, the school that they knew they were going to get into. Well, that's what I was always told growing up that Radford's your safety. Yeah, but but in reality, is it really your safety or is it? A school that you can go to and flourish, but that just goes back to how we deliver what the, what we are. Yeah, that was a narrative that I got. You know, it's just a party school. Yeah, they'll take anybody if you just write your name on the application. But again, like you just said, you go there and flourish. And who's the guy from uh, that works for ESPN came out of Radford? Marty Smith. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Like here's the thing: Did we party? Hell yeah, dude! Like, yeah. Cool. dude, I cheered in college. Like, I went to every mixer there was possible. Mm. Blue <laughs> yeah. in the house, let's go. But the thing is, but I also learned how to work hard. Yeah. Work and hard, play hard, right? And, and that's the aspect. 
But let's be for real, we both know plenty of students that got to Radford. All they did was party, and they weren't there for more than a year. No, I've seen it, yeah. Right? Yeah. And you still see it now. Like, yeah. You know, students that, that come in and out. But, like, the, the, we focus, there's such a focus on a specific narrative as opposed to the positives coming out. But that's true about anything in society. You fuck up once, they're going to remember that fuck up over everything you done, did right. Right. And, and well, that's what more people always remember the negative things more than the positive seems, right? Correct. Correct. Uh, and it's it's unfortunate because we don't allow what's going, you know, what's really what's really being see, shown as opposed to what's being seen. Hmm. Make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. I like you, that. You see this. And that parent that was like, oh, that's just a party school. That's because they know somebody that went their party. Yeah, they're looking only the outside looking in and just based on what somebody heard. 3,000, 2,000 students that graduated and now are gainfully employed, living happy lives. Uh Uh, And, but we as alumni need to change that as well. You know, we we don't, you know, I, I go to alumni events for Radford and I hear alums talking to students and they're like, uh, oh yeah, you know, I had a great time at Radford. Uh, yeah, we all did. Like, they, yeah. they knew that. But, but we also need you to talk more about the academics. Like, yeah. The purpose that you did there. Like, did a professor really inspire you to do something different? You know, that's what is going to sell a student. Every school is a fucking party school. Like I, that's, said, that was, I, was, I was getting ready to say, you can go to Harvard and you're going to be up there finding bars and partying and whatever you want to do. Dude, I, I went up to Boston for, for a national fair and I ran into some students uh, from Harvard at a bar. And these are grad students, and they're just getting tanked. And these kids can dr- – I call them kids. They're probably like 24, 25. <laughs> and these dudes, th- these these people could drink. Like, and they were taking shot for shot with me. And they're like, they're like oh, you, you drink pretty well. No shit, sure. Like, I'm a big motherfucker. <laughs> like, I drink. But I also learned how to drink down in, you know, where, where I went to school. Yeah. And, and they're like, oh, we've never heard of Radford. But it's a regional thing, dude. Like, I get that. I had an interview at Rutgers one time, and they had never heard of Radford, you know, when I was Which up there talking. Because we're both RU. You know what? And I made that stupid joke, and I was like, God, a fucking idiot, you know? But anyway, I don't think they found that funny. But, yeah, they had never heard of Radford either, so. Yeah, and it's, it's crazy, man. Like, obviously, the big names like Rutgers, Penn State, you hear those everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like, even within Pennsylvania. Have you ever heard of a school uh, called Kutztown? Mm-hmm. Kutztown University? No. <laughs> yeah. Right, like who, nope. Lemoyne College, like no, nah, I don't know that one. Schools out there, man, and that's why they're apples, bro. Every they're all the same thing. Teach you some stuff academically, socially, uh, and at the end of the day, you still get a piece of paper that says you committed time to getting that, right? Yeah, and that's what employers want to see. But I, I, you know, it's an interesting concept when people are like, uh, or especially this past year when the pandemic happened, they're like, oh. Yeah, go go to a community college and pay a fourth of what you're going to be paying, as opposed to going to a school and being virtual. And I, I saw that pop up a lot on on, it, on social media, right? Like, right. Remember that, that they're still charging you full tuition, and I'm just like, uh, you're missing a lot of the dots connecting the dots. Is community college cheaper? Of course. Is the virtual class the same? Probably not, because some teachers. Uh, were able to adapt to virtual learning a little bit easier. But in reality, a 4.0 student at any institution is going to get, at a four-year institution is going to get a pretty hefty amount of money when it comes to scholarships. Uh, And while you go to community college, yes, it'll save you money for those first two semesters, but you got to look at college like an investment. Like This goes back to it, right? Yeah. Four years, eight semesters. Uh, you know this as a transfer student, the money allotted to you for scholarship is a lot less than an incoming freshman. Of course. Why? Because the school is investing in you to be there. So who are they going to give the most amount of money to? They should be there longer. Or the person that's only going to be there for two years. Mm -hmm. And so I I kept telling my friends that posted that, I'm like, for a student that is getting their top scholarship, no, they go to that school and they go to that virtual. Because over time, they're going to save more money. Um, for the student that got in, no merit-based, no, no, no scholarship money, no financial aid, community college might be a better option for you in the long run, whatever. Yeah. 
what people don't realize is if a student's admitted freshman year and then decides to go to community college, that scholarship money isn't gonna wait for them to come back. They gotta reapply as a transfer student and lose all that scholarship. Money. Huh. So th there's, you know, when I kept saying that on, on, on social media, like, oh, go to community college, it'll save you money. It'll save you money for the first, sem first two semesters, three semesters. And then when you transfer in, you're not getting as much scholarship money. So you're losing. So a quick, for instance, a student at Delaware top scholarship money is like $19,000. Okay. Year. Or 20,000, let's put it at 20,000. Yeah, easy. Uh, 80,000 over four years. Gotcha. Right. Um, That's room and board and everything. Oh no, the scholarship money. Top oh, scholarship okay. I'm with you now. Scholarship money for, I'm with you for now. Academically is $20,000 a year. Okay. I got you. $80,000. Um, it saves you instead of paying two hundred thousand, you're paying hundred twenty for four years, right? Right. They, these are ballpark figures. Okay. If you were to go come in as a transfer, the highest scholarship that we give is five thousand dollars. Wow. Right. And so you, well, I didn't know there'd be that much difference. Damn. This is like the investment. They're investing in you being there. That's why you get as much as you get out as you take out. You have to give as much as you are going to take out. Right. The university is looking at you the same way. So it, I, I always find it tough when people are like, and I'm not knocking on community college. Community college is a great fucking option for a lot of families, right? Of course. Because uh, at the end of the day, when you graduate from that four-year institution, it doesn't say University of Virginia through um, Virginia Western community college, right? No, it's a University of Virginia diploma. You know, yeah. your diploma behind you doesn't say Radford University through um, which what community college you go to? New River. New River. Yeah. I right? say that. Like, it's still the diploma. But I, there's such a – people look down on community college because they, they're like, oh, you, that's just so you can get in anywhere. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was – you know, when coming out of high school, that's what I always heard. Yeah, if, if you can't get anywhere – you just go to community college and hope for the best, but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, like you said, that's not the narrative. You can do, it, yeah. and it's what we've been saying the whole time. If you put the more work into it, you can make it anything you want to be. Exactly, and I think that's what society means by pulling pulling yourself up by the straps. Um, like if you put work in, you're going to get something out of it. Of course, now, some people have those straps already. Like you're velcroing your straps, but these people are are like Kevlar, you know. <laughs> there's a difference but kind of like what you just said if you're going to put the work into it whether you go to community college first or a four-year you're still going to get a four-year degree mm -hmm. right but those there are students that get to the community college and get comfortable with working part-time and making decent money and then they get tempted with let me keep working and make more money and then they lose interest in school i so, got you. you you know it's we as a society have to change the narrative of course. I think, I think with having a, a an educator in the White House now, uh, with Dr. Jill Biden, you're going to see some changes when it comes to the community college level, which will then have a major effect on four-year institutions. Is that his plan is to for education? Her plan. Dr. Jill Biden. You said Jill Biden. Jill Biden, his wifey. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear that part. I... Yeah, Dr. Jill Biden. She She's an educator, man. She's a... She's a I, professor. I don't know a lot about her. So. Yeah, she's a professor. She she taught at Nova Community College when uh, when uh, P President Biden was a vice president. Um, yeah, dude, she used to take the Amtrak train from D from Northern Virginia up to Delaware, Newark, or Wilmington. Yeah. Huh. It's only a two hour train ride. That's it. That. I didn't know yeah. that. Nah, from DC to, to 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 Newark, two hours, bro. Shit. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot closer than people think, but people think Delaware, and all of a sudden they think Delaware, and they think, oh, man, you're up there in the cold of the north, and it's like... You're, you're not, though, right? You no, know, we're literally east of... Yeah, I was going to say, adjacent. <laughs> yeah. Um, but now, nah, but she, I think you'll see some policy coming into play because of her and her understanding community college and the opportunities it can give a lot of students and stuff like that. So my, my prediction is community college will be a bigger option for low income students. Uh, Cause it'll be, I, I think it'll be free at one point. Um, 
like the state and before. You think community college will be free? Yeah, I think community college will be free in the next 10 to 15 years. Really? Yeah. And then just, is it going to be a stipulation after community college, you go into a four-year university or just free yeah. altogether? Free altogether. You can go into the workforce, whatever it may be. Um, Tennessee does it already. If you're a Tennessee resident, uh, you can go to community college for free and then transfer into one of their one of their public institutions. I didn't know Tennessee did that. Huh. Yeah, like, and it's it, it's good because obviously there's parts of Tennessee that are real rural. Right, of course. And you know, poverty doesn't just exist in the hood; it exists on the farm as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, the, and I, I wish there was. This is going off topic, but that's fine. Racial tensions in this world or in our country is like. Oh, I'm poor because of this person. And in reality, we're poor because of the people up top, not because of our brethren that that are from rural areas or our brethren that are from inner city. You know, and, and poverty with an education, the way I see it, expands more so in the lower class in two polar opposites when you think of the socioeconomic bubble. So, you know, so. Uh, like, what do you so go, yeah keep yeah I lost my train of thought keep going on that rural versus inner city okay poverty is still poverty you just in a different location access, yeah access to things are different like in a rural area you don't have high speed internet yeah I grew up in one of these areas but if you're in the inner city you may have high speed internet but it's hundred and fifty dollars a month which you can't pay for and if for some reason you're able to get it because you're on TANF or whatever it may be, or some type of government help, you're also sharing that internet with four or five other siblings in the house. Right. So we, 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 you know, unfortunately there are people that are say, oh, I'm poor because of the inner city and the inner city is like, oh, I'm poor because of white people. It, it's not like people are poor because the higher ups in the world, right? The 2% that could pretty much solve world hung, or United States, the hunger deficit here in the United States and still have plenty of money left over is got, they, they keep everyone poor. And that's why our economy is so fucked up, man. Like it's a triangle. You can't support wealth distribution is not proper. Well, this makes pretty, pretty uh, good sense because I was talking with somebody the other day and they were talking, I think Flint, Michigan still has zero clean water. Exactly. And they told me that I think there was a place in Virginia that was like that because of the water treatment plant. It's like, how we're in a fucking America and we can't get clean water to these few places? Why? Yeah. I mean, what? Like you're saying, 99% of these, we can get, I can go anywhere I want to get clean water. I can go to a sheets and find clean water. But in Flint, Michigan, I don't understand. Why can't we just not go up there and fix it? What's the issue? That's a million dollar question. Yeah, I don't know enough about it, I guess, to actually get more intelligent about it. But I, I, it just makes zero sense to me that it's almost and, a third world country in, in that area. In parts of the in parts of this country, there's a third world country. Yeah, and it just it blows my mind just thinking about that. Man, it, it's so it's so fucked up for, for lack of better words. But that correlates directly with the education crisis here. Like, I, I read something today. I follow a bunch of accounts on Instagram. And I'm, I'm, I know I'm butchering this, but it says something to the extent of we live in a world where the education system is balanced because of property taxes. So places that were higher property taxes have better schools while maintaining places that were lower property taxes, the hood, right? In rural areas where money isn't evident there and you're keeping education down because you're not providing the taxes to, to go into the school. Hmm. That makes sense now. And so, and you look at school, uh, states without state tax, Florida, right? Their state tax, their public school system is shit. It's, it's some of the lowest public schools performing, lower performing public schools in the entire country. I didn't know that. Yeah, dude, because they don't have state tax. So how do they fund the schools? Not to the extent of, of the Commonwealth. And I will say this, I am happy that I live in a Commonwealth. Because money is distributed pretty evenly throughout. Right. And, you know, living in Southwest Virginia for so long and meeting so many different types of people, uh, when, you know, when Northern Virginia tilts the, the voting 
side. You know, people in Southwest Virginia are like, oh, we should just secede from Nova. Nova should be their own, their own state. I, I wonder if people understood, understand the, the issues that will arise for Southwest Virginia and how, how poor Southwest Virginia would become without the taxes that are coming in from Northern Virginia. Yeah, I mean, worse no than what it already is now. Yeah. No one looks at that in the long run. They're just like, oh, they're they're tilting elections. And it's like, dude, like, we're a commonwealth. I pay higher taxes in Northern Virginia because uh, I know it's going to be distributed not only in Fairfax County, but throughout. Right. Right. So, um, it's, there's so much, man. Like, our education system is fucked. You know, we, we have gone from being one of the top education countries in the world in the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. We've been falling off hard. Yeah. We're like ranked 27th in literacy. Right See, now? I don't even know. Is it 27th in literacy? Mm. Or 27th in math or something like that. It was, it was, it was something junk. I, I know we've been dropping, but. And it's because select few are continuing to rise, but as, an, as a population, we're shit. Yeah, you look at the overall, and it's just yeah, we're shit. So it's great that the top twenty percent can do so well, but what about the rest of the eighty? So do you think maybe if I don't know, I guess these politicians, government, whatever, goes into these inner cities and actually tries to provide more money, perform more opportunities, would we see a change? And they 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 say it. They say they'll do it. Yeah, I mean that's what I've always heard. But you know, um, you know, I get this from Joe Rogan, and he's always talking about if we are want our country to be actually great again, that if they actually went into these inner cities <clears throat> and made less losers, you know, not that they're all losers, but provided more mon- money and opportunities for them, as opposed to just saying, Hey, I'm in the hood. This is how my life is going to be. This is the, uh, the delta of cards. I, I, I was handed. Yeah. This is what I got. But now if we gave them more opportunities to get out of the hood, besides being an athlete or, just a rapper. a rapper randomly just making it just because they actually put in the hard work. Um, I mean, dude, like I heard it, it was, I can't even remember what TV show it was. Maybe it was Trevor Noah. He's cool, he dude. Someone who, who used to be a politician uh, and, and who started off as an advocate and then garnered po- popularity and then became a politician. <laughs> Yeah. And and he said it basically. Hey, shut up. <laughs> he said, I went into it not looking to be a politician. I just went into it to help my community. And then I became a politician. So he was trying to make things better. And then it was automatic automatically became better. because he ran for office like city council and then became mayor and then I think became like house senator or whatever, like state senator, not senator for the, the United for the federal government but for their state and he realized the more in depth he got into actual politics the less help he was actually giving and you you sit back and think like damn so i could i could go into politics politics as as a regular joe schmo just trying to better the education system for that matter yeah but the deeper i get in the less i'm actually helping because now it's about fundraising and shaking the right hands and and making promises to the people that are giving you the money. And do they always like, become corrupt politicians too, just because people are saying, hey, I need you, you to get this vote for X, Y, and Z. And then yeah. that changes their perspective on other things because they're... To, and, so and that thing. changes their, yeah, that changes what they normally, that what they first went into the pop, to be a politician to better their community. But mm-hmm. then like, oh, shit. Yeah. Dude, and look, look at look at big winners in the past. Even in the past, like, not even national elections, but like Senate elections. Who are the ones that are winning? The ones that fundraise the most. Of course. Get the most greenbacks, right? Yeah. And that's unfortunate. Like, so uh, I think Carlos Mencia, and I know Joe Rogan and Carlos Mencia don't get along. Yeah. But I, I used to listen to Carlos Mencia growing up, and he said, he said, fuck this electoral process where you go up there and debate. Because all that shit is nothing but empty promises. Well, I think when I get into office, I'm going to do this. He goes, "Fuck that." Tell me who sponsors you, so I can decide. Do I want? Do I like Coke or Pepsi? Yeah. <laughs> Who's backing you as a candidate? Because if I don't, if I don't like Coke, I'm going to go with the guy that's get, getting backed by Pepsi. Oh, well, that goes back to higher education too, because most schools are either a Coke or a Pepsi school. Too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
should that be a deciding factor in who you're what school you're going to? No. The other, right? Yeah. And I, I never realized that before working in higher education. It's like, damn, they gotta sign contracts to either be with Coke or Pepsi. Yeah, dude, like, can you believe that? No, I would have never thought that. I mean, you know, I I figured restaurants, okay, I get that, but I mean, they were at a college here. I mean, just give me a if I want a Coke or a Pepsi, damn, give it to me, right? Just it's wild to me. There, there's so much, and it's and that's the sad part, man. Our world is so tied up behind money and contracts, and that's the capitalistic world, world we live in. Yeah, and and one other thing that I learned from working in higher education was free speech zones. Yeah. Didn't I, you know? I'd assume that it was all everywhere was, but it's not. There's, they have a certain, obviously, you know, certain zones. Like I think in Radford, it's at the Heath Clocks, maybe. I can't even remember now. That's where it was anyway. But yeah, that's the only time if you want to protest or. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's crazy, man. And it's unfortunately, it's a public institution and there's still limitations. But I, I get why they have the limitations. Could, could you imagine uh, people coming to protest on campus on a daily basis? Oh, man. I mean, what, was it that Evergreen College? Um, I think in, was it in California where they just erupted and it just almost became a, it was an unsafe area at all times mm-hmm. as far as riots and, you know, students getting behind a political idea and just, you know, if they brought in, a, I thought what speaker they brought in, but people were not wanting him to be there. Yeah. I think it was, um, what's his name? The outspoken guy. Yeah. yeah. He's real outspoken. I, the name just passed me by. And, and ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro. Yeah. yeah. That sounds right. And, yeah, and uh, you know, students were causing uproars. Like oh, they had almost had to close down the whole campus. Yeah, but it's funny how you know people are like, "Oh, they're 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 silencing the conservative view," and it's not really silencing. It's like most education places are liberal. They're teaching you to think broadly. You know, and and unfortunately, we were. Uh, I don't like to get into politics. But I, well, I we don't, yeah, we don't have to get into that. But, I, I do feel more and more now because the reason we're in the situation that we're in politically is because growing up, you know, our generation was taught don't talk about politics, religion, or sexuality. See, and that's what you know. I've I've said on here. I always get nervous if those topics start coming up because I don't feel very educated in those topics. Plus, you know, you know, as you just said, don't talk about it because you're almost going to start. Yeah, a huge but, debate or war, and so I'm going to be the bad guy in this. But it, you know, I want to get comfortable with those. When it when it comes to political jargon and political talk, isn't it all mostly based off of opinion and not fact? Yeah, it's just based off. Usually, when growing up, it was based off oh, because mom and pop said that, and yeah. and I didn't know any different. Just, right? Yeah, because that's what I was taught. And religion, how is how does it affect me as a person that you are worshiping another another god than I am? Mm-hmm. Nothing. I don't care. Uh, or like sexuality, for instance. It's like people that have issues with the LGBTQ community are the people that go to Subway and get real upset because the person in front of them didn't get the same exact sandwich they did. Really? Yeah, like you can't... If it, if it doesn't affect you personally, and I'm not talking about like your family or, or, or whatnot, because, you know... But if it doesn't affect you personally, it's not like these people are coming to knock on your door and say, hey, you want to get married? No, dude, no. I, don't, I don't care about you. I don't yeah. fuck about you. Yeah. even fuck about them. Exactly. You know, and that's, that's the whole political thing. Like, do I have friends that are on the conservative side? Of course. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I have friends on both sides. I try. I, I want to see things through both sides. Yeah. And not and, be and, married and, to an idea. Exactly. And that's where I get in trouble. Or somebody. <laughs> yeah. I do, and most people other probably get in trouble because they think, <laughs> no, this is what I've heard. This is what I stand behind, and not. And I agree that you should be that way and that's fine but there's also just because you've heard that doesn't make it's true and that's actually legit Correct. Correct. i mean like, and we've been saying you know evolve you know learn new things you know because i i mean my eyes have been opened up you know a lot what we've been talking about tonight that with the missions and stuff and i would have never thought that but there's also new things i can learn about and oh that makes sense too in the way you're seeing it never never looked at it in your eyes exactly exactly man I, i'm I, we're, we're so we're so reliant on just, you know, everybody's like, oh, you need to learn to communicate. Yes, you need to learn to communicate. But there's a huge factor of that entire thing that you're missing, and that's understanding. Mm-hmm. We need to learn to communicate, but we also need to learn to understand. Of course. And, and, yeah, very- and I was talking to somebody else, you know, going on communication, having these 
civil debates. Yeah, I mean, we can disagree on something, and that doesn't mean we have to go go crazy and start throwing drinks at each other and get mad and fist fight. We can just talk about it out, man. It's not, you know. Then Okay, then at the end of the day, all right, well, I don't have to hang out with that person like you said. I'm, I'm the same way, too. Like, we can disagree on things as long as it doesn't affect someone's right to be who they want to be. Right. We disagree that you like coffee from, from Colombia versus I like coffee from Cuba. Right? right. That's a disagreement. But when people talk about, oh, especially in the South, we got to keep Confederate statues. I'm like, bro, don't... They're, they're symbols. They're symbols. If, if they're really symbols of heritage, why didn't those Confederate statues go up right after the Civil War? Why didn't they go up until the 1950s and 1960s? Was that when they went up? Yeah, man. I didn't say I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. But I, I was watching. Uh, amend. Have you ever, did you see that Netflix documentary? What's it called? Amend. Amend. No. Uh, the fight for 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 U.S. His, the history of the U.S. or something like that. Will Smith directs it. No shit. All right, hold on. Let me put, let me put this in my notes real quick. Keep 14th Amendment, bro. It'll it'll shatter your mind. A M E N D. Yeah, like amend, like an amendment. Okay. Yeah, amend. The fight for for the U.S. or something. Like it's that. on Netflix. All right, I put it in there. I'll have to check this out. It's, it's badass. So so go on about it. So they're talking about talking about the Fourteenth Amendment and how it changed the world and how it changed the world for for voting and civil rights and then LGBTQ rights and human rights and watch it, bro. You, watch it. It should be a message. You'll be like, you're gonna be like, holy shit, I didn't know any of that. Oh shit. Okay. I I don't know, man. Like, and I know we're going completely off tangent because we started on education. Now we're in politics. But it's all involved, and it's all, and we have to be able to talk about it as a human race, right? Um, well, if you don't, but, t- if you don't talk about it, it'll never, nothing will ever get solved. Yeah, if we don't talk about it, we don't get educated on. it. Yeah, and just you know, it just it'll keep sweeping it under the rug, and that's what's going to keep causing more issues and more issues, and until you know, it just like we had the riots just happen recently, obviously. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I don't know, man. I, I was in DC for those, and <laughs> how how was that for you? Was it uh? I mean, I, I, I was in D.C., like, but I lived, what, 20 minutes away from D.C.? At the yeah. Time. So did it not really affect you? or? No. Uh, I mean, you could see the Virginia State Police flying up 95 to, to get there and whatnot. Yeah. But um, what, what terrified me was seeing the noose in front of the Capitol. Shit. Um, so why, you know, domestic terrorists brought that in front of it, you know, yeah, because we're getting protesting, whatever you went up there, protested that you were unhappy with the election. Great, the moment you brought the news up, you're bringing it, you're bringing a whole different aspect from riots and protesting to domestic terrorism. Yeah, that's just too far when you start, and, and, and that's what I have my issues with. Like, do I have Trump supporting friends? Hell yeah, but like it's who it's the world we live in, and some people think that that's the, the proper avenue for them. Um, but it goes to us being a society of me, 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 and not a collective. Well, yeah, I mean, we're the United States, you know. But, it, but yeah, it, it, like you just said, we're not. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're in there's a. So, there's so much work we got to do as a society individually. Um, but it, it's gotta, it's gotta be. We gotta be more worried about the person next to us, while also worrying about ourselves. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting factor, man. Yeah, I mean, I've and always you, heard that you're supposed to take care of yourself first, but, but you know, just looking out for yourself, is that, you know, it's not maybe the best? Between, there's, a, there's a difference between self-care and only caring for yourself. Okay, there you go. That's a good way to put it. I like that. Yeah. Like, self-care for us is having these chats, shooting the shit, mm-hmm. and just catching up and, and talking real terms and, and real issues and shit like that and, and educating each other and just different points of view, that's self-care. Now, when we take these conversations and take have it with the next person over, that's also caring for them, right? So, like, it's sad, man, because I've had a lot of people say, well, the economy, I'm like, well, if the only thing you're worried about is the economy. You're worried about the people that provide the economy you're not worried about the people that drive the economy which is the people mm-hmm. you got to help the people to help the economy move right and so it's so the, what do you mean like it's 
when you say help the people, you know, there's there's been talks about a universal paycheck, I guess, universal check. Yang Yang. Yeah, I mean, he was talking about it, and so, I mean, is that kind of what you're saying? That yeah, I mean, in my opinion, I'm not a political expert. I'm not an economy expert. Whatever. Oh yeah, we don't do that on this show, but man. The way, Just... it, the way I see it, and maybe it might correlate with some way someone else sees it. What the Bernie Sanders of the world and the Andrew Yangs of the world are doing is the same thing, just from different talking points. Mm-hmm. Bernie saying, let's go ahead and lower, you know, college cost and- uh, Raise minimum wage. Raise minimum wage and uh, provide uh, affordable um, child care and health care in that aspect. But Andrew Yang is like, all right, let's keep it the same, but let's give everybody an extra thousand bucks. Mm-hmm. So they're saying the same thing, just coming at it from different different sides. Correct. Right? And, and then you get some politicians that are like, well, no, we just need to impact the economy and, and, and stimulate it more, right? And well, how are you going to stimulate it if nobody's got money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you can't get it going again if no one... Of course, the poor, which is your lar- the largest part of your population when it comes to money, you know, because it's only, the, what, the top 2% that have billions of dollars, you don't yeah. need to give them more money to stimulate the economy. You need to give the people down here to give them to stimulate. Mm-hmm. Them. And it's, it, I don't know, man. Like, it's upsetting. It's disheartening. Uh, but I always say, capitalism really only helps those with capital. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I agree. Yeah, if you got capital, you can do anything you want to do. Exactly. Those you don't have it, well, shit. I guess I'll just. To sit you're, here. You're gonna be the one or two percent that can get lucky and make capital for yourself. But in reality, average Joe's like you and I, unless we hit the lottery, we're not gonna be making millions and millions of dollars. No. And if we do at one point, it's because it took us twenty plus years. Yeah, twenty plus work years of entrepreneurship and getting, hard work. Yeah, being, hard work, getting and lucky ass, and you know, giving shout outs to, to draft top. For them to sponsor you on your next one, right? <laughs> like, it, I, I don't know, man. Like, there's so much fucked up in the world and there isn't one solid answer. And that's the unfortunate part about who we are as a society. We want black and black and white answers. Mm-hmm. But we, we try to avoid the gray, but there's so much gray. Because that answer, while it's great for one person, it may not be great for the other. Yeah, and there's no way to, to like you're just saying... Find that meat, find that middle. No, not at all, bro. And it's the same thing with education. Just to go back full circle, Harvard is a great institution, no doubt. Is it great for some students? Yes. Will it be a poor choice for other students? Of course. Yeah. So here we are, man. <laughs> man, you brought it back full circle. So we just end it right there. <laughs> I tried to, man. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we definitely just shot the shit. It, it, what we just had was literally what would have been happening on a patio at McAdoo's or Sharky's cigar. Yeah. And see, this, and that's what I've been trying to tell people. This is what I want this podcast to be like, you know, just to sit down it'd be authentic. We sit around and just, you know, I don't want to be scripted. We just go off whatever's on top of head. If we're wrong, I've been called out numerous times already on stuff. I've been, that's fine. It's okay. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And, but at least I have the balls to say, Hey, I was wrong. Yeah. And that's part of it, man. Okay. Well tell me how I was wrong. Okay. But then I'll fix it next time. I'll grow. That's what I. That's what I'm I will about. evolve. There we go, baby. <laughs> but yeah, um, let's end it on a good note, man. You brought it back full circle. Um, nothing but good times. I appreciate you being here. I'd shake your hand if we were in person. I wish we were. But next time you come to Radtown, maybe we. Uh... Well, bro, I, I just I moved to Richmond here recently. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm living in Glen Allen now, so if you're ever up this way, hit me up. I got a guest room and everything. Oh. If you're if you're not allergic to cats. No, no, can't. We, we got a, we got an adorable little puppy too. Okay. Which, yeah. So, plenty of room, man. Come shoot the shit. There's a bunch of breweries out here. You know, I always got a Cuban cigar in my in my. I store. love that, man. You speak in my language, bro. <laughs> and we could do we could do bourbon too, or we could do a nice stout, whatever. It hey, may man, be. It's, it's your it's your world up there. I'll, I'll just be happy just to be part of it, man. So. <laughs> yeah, brother. Well, as always, I can tell everybody, man. Stay safe. Stay well. Appreciate you for having me. Uh, of really course. 
uh, and hopefully we get to shit, shoot the shit in the future in person. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah, this is a great conversation. Like again, appreciate you being here and all that good stuff. And yeah, hopefully I get to see you soon <laughs> enough. Say what? I said, next time we'll just talk st- strictly sports. <laughs> yeah, not get off on politics and education. So. Yeah, but we still got to get into it because it's all political. Yeah, dude, it all, like you just said, it'll come back around full circle, man. So, <laughs> All right, Louis, man, I'll let you go, man. Again, appreciate you. All right, brother. All right, later, bud. Later, man.